Hi and welcome to today's video where I'm going to be talking about our Tesla Powerwall installation and solar upgrade. So this will be a useful video if you are thinking about solar or maybe you've already got solar and you're thinking about a battery. Uh, I'm going to cover quite a few points. I'll try and cover some of the finances as best I can uh, and you can maybe make an educated decision at the end. Um, if you like today's video then please click like just below and of course it'd be great to have you on board as a subscriber. If you find these kind of videos interesting you'll probably find my other videos interesting hopefully. But in the meantime here is the intro. Okay, so let me start by explaining what we had and what we have now. So when we moved into this house, it had seven solar panels on the roof, which gave about 1.9 kilowatts. Um, so we've upgraded this summer and taken those seven off and replaced them with 16 new ones, slightly more powerful, which now gives us just shy of six kilowatts. Um, we also added the Tesla Powerwall, um, along with the, which is a Powerwall 2, I believe, along with the Tesla Gateway 2, which I'll explain more about in a moment, um, which gives gives us a 13.5 kilowatt storage capacity. So that's what we have now. Um, now to explain a little bit about how it all works, um, so if I talk you through um, the different components and how they talk to each other, that's probably the best place to start because it's not, it's not overly complicated, but you do need to kind of understand what does what and how. Um, so if you look at this chart now, you can see that right at the top, you've got the six kilowatt solar panels. So will they feed in up to six kilowatts, um, optimally on a really sunny day. Uh, these went in in August, by the way, so I must admit we've not had too many of those since. And that feeds into the test gateway that does of course go via uh, an inverter um, but for the sake of rather than sort of adding an extra component essentially the inverter then puts out the power to the gateway the gateway is then connected to the Tesla battery um, the battery itself is a largely dumb item I mean the only smart element about it is that it knows that it, it is paired with that gateway so if for example it was stolen for whatever reason which is um, would be difficult because it weighs about 130 kilos but if it was um, it wouldn't work with any other gateway without Tesla themselves configuring it so it's largely had a dumb battery at the bottom there you have the house um, so obviously the, uh, the, the the crux of it all everything is about providing power to the house and then over on the left you've got the mains grid so power coming in from um, from our electricity supplier connected to that by the way is our pod point so the pod point is our electric car charger that we use to um, charge my Tesla car um, now the important point here is that I said everything goes into the gateway and the gateway is the only thing that's connected to the house now the reason for that and the way that works is the gateway, as I said, is the brains. So that has all these things coming into it. So it has the solar coming in, it has the mains coming in, it has the battery connected to it, and of course the set the house. So it decides what to do with the power. So for example, if there is power coming from the solar, the first thing it does is feed the house. So if there's enough power from solar to power the house, then it, that's what it'll do first and foremost. If there's more power coming in from solar than the house needs, then it puts the excess into the battery. So therefore, you're powering the house and you're slowly trickle charging the battery. If the house has all the power it needs, the battery's fully charged and there's still more power coming from solar, that's when it puts it back to the grid and you can generate payments, albeit absolutely tiny ones unless you signed up to solar about 15, 20 years ago. Um, now, if there's less power coming in from the solar, um, say not enough to power the house, then what the gateway will do is it will tap into the battery. So it will take power from the battery to power the house. What it will do at all costs is trying to avoid power taking power from the grid. So it'll run off the battery and then once the battery is either run out or if there's just not enough power, maybe the house is using one and a half kilowatts of power at that point and the battery could only, um, only has enough power in it to maybe provide one kilowatt of it, then the other half will come from the grid. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Um, and then crucially, um, what's really, really cool about these, if I go back to this chart, is when you look at it, the interesting thing is that if the power is cut from the mains grid, so if there's a power cut for whatever reason, um, then obviously that will mean that there's no power coming to the pod point and there's no power then going into the Tesla gateway from the grid. What the gateway then does is allows it to completely isolate from the grid. Um, so therefore the battery will run the house. So the, the pod point is obviously one of the major power consumers because when you're charging a car, it can take up to seven kilowatts. There's a lot of power going out. Um, so when it's disconnected from the mains, what it means is that the, uh, the battery can then power the house. And so hopefully you have a completely seamless experience in terms of um, basically having constant electricity supply. Um, the thing you've got to bear in mind is not every battery system is capable of doing this. The important thing what the gateway does is exactly that. 
it closes the gate. Because if you have a live connection between the battery and the mains, say the battery the mains stops providing power, but the battery's still live, that can send power back onto the grid, which can electrocute an engineer that might be working on the grid, fixing the power cut. Um, so a gateway is quite special in the sense that it can lock that door. So the battery can power the house in isolation without making the grid harmful. That's an important point and it's a real differentiator because not every battery has the capacity to do that. So just then I touched on the fact that solar, if you signed up 15, 20 years ago, is very different to solar now. Let me explain what that means. Um, so when they first launched um, solar and encouraging houses to put them on, the government put some policies in place that, quite frankly, when you look back now, are ridiculously good. Um, so, for example, I think if you signed up right at the beginning, for every kilowatt of power you generated, you get paid, I think just shy of 50 pence per kilowatt. Even if you use it, you're literally it's getting paid to generate it. And then any excess that you sell to the grid, they pay you, I think, an additional five pence per kilowatt. So you can make real money if you have a solar panel um, system that was set up and registered, said about 15 years ago. Um, that's fantastic if you're one of those guys, in which case, would you bother with a battery? Um, you could from an environmental point of view, but realistically, from a financial point of view, you've got that much money coming in. I'm not sure you're going to be too concerned about what you're saving. Um, but it's you should still obviously keep it in the mix because there's a lot of good reasons to have it, particularly from a power cut point of view. Um, at the end of the day, if your solar is only paying you if it generates. And in winter, which we're in now, it's December uh, 2021, um, the solar panels aren't doing a great deal. So therefore, a battery would be really, really useful. Yeah, it's great if the solar pays money, but only for the sun. So what we get paid as a house that signed on to the policy about three years ago is we get paid the following breakdown for what we generate and what we sell back to the grid, which, as you can see, is very, very different to what you would have got 15 years ago. So in which case, now it's more important to figure out what you're going to do with that electricity because it doesn't really pay you a great deal to put it back to the grid. So you want to use it one way or another. Enter the battery. Now what the battery of course allows you to do is to be able to take the power from the sun that you're not using, as I mentioned before, put it in the battery and then when the sun sets or, or maybe it's just not as bright, then the battery can then power the house. The logic in that's very, very straightforward. There are more factors to take into account though. Um, so say for example with the Tesla battery, um, what we've done, uh, because we've got the Tesla car, is the off-peak and on-peak electricity tariffs make a big difference. So for example, we have um, Octopus Go, and what that means is we pay five pence per kilowatt for power between half past midnight and half past four in the morning. And then it's like 15.8 pence the rest of the time. So therefore, that electricity in those four hours is super, super, super cheap in comparison to the rest. You know, it's like so just under a third of the cost. So we want to use that as much as we possibly can. Now, what the Tesla battery does is it's smart enough to know uh, what the weather's going to be like. So it's got a good idea about how much sun it isn't or isn't going to get from the solar panels. So what it does is if it knows there's not power coming from there, it looks for it elsewhere. Once you've told it you're on an off-peak electricity tariff, which you do in the Tesla app, then it knows that if it can't get power from the sun, it should charge the battery during the off-peak hours in those four hours when it's 5p a kilowatt. So our system, because there's no sun at the minute or very little, that's what it does. We'll, you'll see our electricity between half past 12 and half past four in the morning just goes really high. But at five pence per kilowatt, it's fine. It's not cost. It'll literally end up costing just a few pounds. But that power that's in the battery can run the house on an average day till about six or seven p.m. Yes, it'll get a little bit of solar kind of topping it up, but essentially we are looking at about 14 hours a day's worth of power coming directly from the battery, not touching the grid. And then at the night time, the grid has to kick in because the battery's dead until half past 12 and then the whole thing starts again. So what we do is to capitalize on those four hours is we charge the battery, we charge the car. And if you've seen one of my other videos, you'll see that we have a hot tub. And as I outlined in that video, using off-peak car electricity tariffs is the absolute key to heating that. So we also have the heater on and the hot tub for those four hours. So those four hours, we blitz our power, which is off-peak. It's the lowest demand on the grid, so it's actually better for the grid. And then the rest of the day, the hot tub stays warm, the car's charged, and of course, our Tesla battery is powering the house. Hope all that makes sense. So to be fair, you can start to see the appeal. Um, there are te uh, specific tariffs to do with um, the Tesla battery. Well, how that works is, I think it's 11 pence per kilowatt here. Uh, and what that means is that when we buy any power, any time from the grid, it's 11 pence per kilowatt. So what you might say, obviously, that's not as good as what we have now uh, with the off-peak. 
But the big thing is that any power we then sell back to the grid also pays 11 pence per kilowatt. So it's a flat fee going in or going out. Now what that means is it allows Tesla to use our battery as well as us. So the solar, for example, any solar that's generated is either stored in the battery, power in the house, or exported to the grid at 11 pence per kilowatt. Uh, and then later on the day when the battery's dead, we buy that power back at 11 pence per kilowatt. So we get to use every bit of solar power. But it also means Tesla can use the battery to actually, they can charge it and deplete it themselves and actually feed the grid to help the grid when it's under pressure. So it actually helps the grid widely. But from our point of view, I must admit right now, we're sticking with Octopus Go. Uh, and the Tesla tariff is from Octopus as well. Um, and it's exclusively from them. But the, um, with the Octopus Go tariff right now, when there's no sun, that five pence during the night allows us to do everything. When we get to spring going into summer, and we've got more power come from these panels, as I said, we only installed them at the end of August, um, so we've not really seen the optimum, um, maybe we'll reassess, because at that point, there'll be a lot of power generation. I've got some figures here, for example, and our solar generated in September 398 kilowatts. Um, by October, it dropped to 167, and in November, it dropped to just shy of 73. You know, so the difference seasonally is massive. Um, now, compared to our old panels, um, which were a third of the power, essentially, that means we've generated an extra 265 kilowatts. If I value them as the peak rate at 15.8 pence, that's nearly 42 pounds a month, just from that one month. So those extra panels, that's a big saving. And over the year, that will that will obviously pan out a bit a bit better. October, where the take the solar and consumption was sorry, the solar generation was a bit lower. We value that at about seventeen pounds fifty, so not too much. And November was about six, about seven pounds sixty-seven. So not huge savings when the sun's not out, because that's the nature of solar. But the battery is saving us money because, of course, the battery at thirteen and a half kilowatts. Let's say because we never run it completely dry, we always leave it at five percent just in case. So let's say it's thirteen kilowatts that we're using. So forty-two pounds per month uh, is being saved by having the battery. Now, you might go, great, now that, that's good, but obviously the cost of the battery then comes into play because £42 per month is something, but what does that really mean uh, when you're looking at the cumulative cost? So I'll be transparent. What does it cost? So for us, we went for the price of removing the seven kilowatt panels, uh, sorry, the seven um, panels that equated to 1.9 kilowatts, and then replacing them with these 16 brand new ones. So we were paying for the removal of the old ones, um, the payment of the new ones and the installation of the new ones became we have them integrated into the tiles as you can see on this picture here so therefore the tiles had to be removed and there was some roof work to be done so there was that side and that cost us about seven thousand pounds nearer nearest nearest damn it um the bit that you're probably most interested in is the tesla battery what did that cost um so the the battery the gateway and the full installation um that cost us Again, pretty much bang on £9,000 uh, in August 2021. So it's about £16,000 installation altogether. We've still got the old panels and the old inverter. Um, they were taken off uh, with the intention of us eBaying them. We might get something for it. It won't be a great deal. But let's assume, um, let's assume, actually, let's assume nothing from it. Let's just look at our total cost of £16,000. So if I'm saving uh, £40 per month just by having the battery, um, so over the year, that's £480. That's not a great deal. You know, let's round it up to 500 just for numbers. We're paying off 16. That's a 32-year break-even. Obviously not ideal. But then, of course, the, the upgrade in the solar, the value of that is quite important. If we look at that throughout the year, I estimate that we'll probably, realistic, that's probably going to be the best part of another um, £40 per month. So in which case, suddenly, that's £1,000. So if there's £1,000 being saved from power because you're using the battery, and £1,000 being, or sorry, £500 being saved because you're using the battery, and £500 being made um, because of the value of the solar, add it together, £1,000, 16000 so therefore your break-even is 16 years. I hope you're following me on this so far. Um, what we did, because you can still look at that and think, well, that's, I'm not sure that's necessarily the right way to go. What I cannot tell you is how much electricity is going to cost in the future, because if the prices continue going up, then obviously that break-even point is going to come down. Um, I also can't tell you about um, degradation on the battery. Um, Tesla assure me it will degrade very, very slowly, and we should be fine keeping that power input, but inevitably there will be some. There's all these variables that I can take into account, and there's quite a few that I can't. So you'll just have to make follow me kind of from an educated guest point of view, because I don't think I can give you specifics. But specifically because if we look at the fact that obviously we have this hot tub and it doesn't run all the time, you know, if it's warm enough, then it might run for um, 30 minutes, it might run for four hours. It's set on its own timer to not run beyond four hours outside of those peaks. So 
That's a three kilowatt heater, um, five pence per kilowatt, 15 pence per hour, four hours, it's costing 60p a night maximum. But the chance are I probably won't run for that long. So therefore that kind of skews my calculations, so I can't be super accurate. Um, so you could still look at this and let's say it's a 16 year break even and think, not really worth doing. Um, I personally think it would be, but then we have something else to take into account because I went from the Audi Q7 that you will have seen in one of my other videos um, to the Tesla Model 3, which I drive as a company car now, which you'll also see in other videos. Um, so therefore, my costs went down from about £4,800 a year, even with my car allowance from work, because of the cost of insurance and servicing and tax and diesel, it was very thirsty, and tyres and all those things, the car was costing about £4,800 a year, um, even taking into account said business mileage reimbursement uh, and all the benefits that came from having the car allowance. Whereas the Tesla, um, as you'll have seen uh, from my other videos, if you watch them, if not, please do, um, the links I'll put down there. Um, that means that we now pay for about the same uh, mileage. I think it's about 450. So the saving is about four and a half thousand pounds. That, that much I know. It's a massive, massive saving because I'm not having to insure tax service, blah, 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 blah. And the cost of running it is a fraction of the cost of running a diesel or a petrol. So cumulatively, that four and a half thousand pounds saving, I need to take that into account. So if I add the four and a half thousand, which is all part of, because it was all part of our mission to move to be more sustainable. So we changed the car, we did the solar, we did the battery. So our savings now, therefore, are more like five and a half thousand pounds a year. Now, suddenly, when you look at the 16,000 pound cost, we break even in three years or just over, which is fantastic. And that is the logic I've applied. Um, call it slightly twisted logic to suit my objectives, but um, I think it's realistic. Those are actual savings we're making. And then once you pass the three years, that's just ongoing saving money. We are we are that much better off every year. Um, so therefore, in conclusion, should you or shouldn't you? Um, honestly, if you're thinking of solar, I wouldn't dream of getting solar without batteries. There's just no point. Unless you know you're going to use every single bit of it and are you really gonna be like, oh, sun's out, I'll put the washing machine on. I suspect not. In which case, you really do need to think, okay, with a battery, at least I can use it all. There are a lot of batteries. Some are cheap, some are expensive. The Tesla one is relatively expensive, but per kilowatt, because most aren't 13 and a half, they're like five, per kilowatt hour, it's actually one of the better value batteries. Combined with the gateway that can isolate you from the grid, that means it's actually um, completely safe to use in the case of a power cut. Most are not. So, you know, don't be fooled by kind of the just looking at the price and thinking that's a no. It could be a false economy if you save money by buying something that simply doesn't last as long and isn't useful in the situations you might actually need it. So don't shut it off quite so soon. But if you're thinking about solar, yes, I would absolutely get a battery. I think you'd be semi nuts not to, if I'm honest. If you've already got solar and you're on a tariff that pays you very little, then the battery is well worth thinking about. You just need to think about that break-even point. If you're in our situation, you're thinking, do you know what, I'm going all in. I'm gonna sell the petrol diesel, I'm gonna get some panels, I'm getting a battery, then absolutely you should do it because your break-even point will be so, 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 so much lower than if you weren't doing the whole thing together. The car makes a massive difference, it does, and I can't ignore it because that's our change. And that's it. Um, hopefully the information's been useful for you. I know I kind of go off on tangents, a bit rambly, I apologize, that's just um, me. But yeah, if you have any questions, please just just put them in the comments below and I'll do my very best to, uh, to answer because I'd imagine there probably are a few. And of course, if you enjoyed the video or even found it remotely useful, please just hit that like button and it'd be great if you could hit the subscribe button as well. But, uh, but thanks so much for your support and hope to see you at my next video. All right, take care. Bye.